Hello, friends and colleagues. Um, welcome to the ANRCB Projects module on introductory concepts in nutrition. This is our sixth video in which we'll discuss nutritional assessment. In this uh, video, we would like to have participants be able to explain the importance of nutritional assessment as an indicator for nutritional well being. We would like you to be able to recognize different methods in nutritional assessment and understand their purposes and applications. And we would also like you to be able to explain how nutritional assessment helps to indicate the nutritional status of an individual community or population, to track the healthy growth of children, and to identify risk of non-communicable diseases. So let's begin by talking about nutritional status and then get into its assessment. So first, nutritional status is the current body status of a person or of a population group, and it's related to their state of nourishment, um, their consumption and utilization of nutrients in particular. So nutritional status is determined by many factors as we have been discussing throughout this module, and these include internal factors things such as our age, our sex, our eating behaviors, our physical activity, our um, disease status, as well as external or environmental factors. These could be related to the, to the food systems, the food environment, food safety, culture, um, your social econ and economic circumstances, and so on. So nutritional assessment then is the measurement of, of nutritional status, and it can be done in um, using a variety of methods that involve anthropometry or the measurement of the body. It can involve biochemical measures, clinical assessment, or the analysis of dietary data to determine whether either a population or a group of people are well nourished or not. And the value here is to assess the nutritional situation in a target population, um, understand what the causes are of any problems or deficiencies, um, and then take action, which then can be analyzed through further assessment. So we will describe here a variety of direct methods of assessing nutritional status and a few indirect methods as well. So the direct methods deal with individuals while indirect methods tend to use more community or population level indices that can give you an idea of the community's nutritional status. So for example, we have data at multiple levels. We can talk about things that are at the country level or even regional level, high levels. Um, we can talk about specific communities um, or institutions within a country. We can talk about the household, which has multiple people, and we can talk about assessment at individual level. And so at the country level, there are various sources of data. Um, there are national surveys, there are food balance sheets um, from FAO, which we will discuss, um, that look at food availability. At the community level, we might look at food availability and prices in local markets. We can look at schools and health systems and so on. At the household level, we can look at food consumption and at the individual level, we have a variety of options that we'll discuss here in depth. So we want to do nutritional assessment for a multitude of reasons. We might want to identify whether one individual or a whole population is at risk of becoming malnourished. And we'll discuss this in more detail, but malnourished means undernutrition and overnutrition. Um, where overweight and obesity and the excess of certain foods and um, nutrients and components can actually lead to diets of um, related chronic diseases as well. So that's one purpose is to identify this risk of malnourishment. Um, the other would be to develop programs, policies, interventions that can address nutritional needs we can also then monitor the effect of all of these programs and interventions and policies to see whether they're efficacious and whether they're effective. So here, when we, think, when we consider um, assessments of individuals to understand their well-being and that of the population they represent, 
we have different options. Um, in general, there's anthropometry, measurement of the body, biochemical indicators or biomarkers, clinical assessments, and dietary assessments. And you can kind of see here that this um, will spell A, B, C, D. So sometimes to help you remember, you can think of A, B, C, D to remember these different kinds of nutritional assessment. So anthropometry, we've discussed this in previous topics. Um, we can measure heights, weights. We can calculate certain indicators such as height for age or weight for age or look at stunting or underweight. Um, this can be used to assess child growth and development. It can also be used to assess um, risk factors for adults and then their well-being as well. Um, biochemical indicators or biomarkers. Um, here's one example. We can look at um, serum or plasma retinol in blood, and that's an indicator of vitamin A deficiency. So then we can look at the prevalence in a population of low values of this biomarker, which can then indicate the degree of public health problem that we observe in that population. A clinical assessment involves um, things that are, are visible and can be assessed through a trained, by a trained professional, such as a doctor or nurse. For example, if we're again thinking about vitamin A, we can consider night blindness as a, a clinical manifestation of vitamin A deficiency. So we could assess or have as a nutritional indicator the proportion of pregnant women with night blindness. A larger proportion um, indicates a public health problem. Similarly, if we're interested in vitamin A, we want to look at diets. We can look at dietary intake of vitamin A, and that would quantify the quality of the diets and the, ad the nutrient adequacy in those diets. So let's start with the A, anthropome anthropometry. So this is a, a, a valuable um, use, a, a method of assessment to know about the nutritional status of an individual or a population of children, of adults, really all age groups. Um, the rationale for children, I think, is important. Um, even though we think about populations throughout the world being different, if populations, if mothers and children are well fed, are receiving good care, they're healthy, they have no infectious diseases, and they don't suffer from deprivations, they have good access to services, um, they're not poor. What we find is children, mothers and children um, in, those, in this kind of positive environment all grow similarly. We do not have genetic differences between us um, in how well we grow. And so we can use a certain set of health standards of healthy growth for all children throughout the world. Um, anthropometry has a lot of benefits. Um, it gives you this quantitative assessment of nutritional status. <clears throat> it's not invasive, meaning you know you don't need to um, draw blood or do anything else that's um, difficult for, for a person. It's usually relatively inexpensive to do. Um, it does require training to, to do that, but data collectors do not require as much training or equipment or supplies as, for example, um, if you're doing a biomarker or a biochemical assessment that would require, you know, someone who is trained to draw blood, um, someone who is trained to handle that blood and to measure it in a laboratory with the right equipment and the right supplies. So those are generally more um, resource intensive. Anthropometry is relatively not so. Um, so anthropometry, you can measure many aspects of the body. The common ones are height and weight and various proportions within the body. Um, certainly for young children who cannot stand tall, we measure them lying down or recumbent. There are different um, measures that we can use. Um, common ones are waist circumference, hip circumference, um, BMI or body mass index. We can look at the ratio of the waist to the hip um, or to from the waist to the height. These are common. Um, a lot of these metrics are used to predict the risk of non-communicable diseases, such as diabetes and hypertension. Many of these non-communicable diseases, um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, certain types of cancers are associated um, with higher weight. 
So people who have different forms of overweight and obesity are at higher risk of these diet-related chronic diseases. And we'll mention this several times here. So, so let's talk a little bit more about these measurements. Certainly, um, weight can be used for adults and children to identify normal growth and to, for in the case of adults, to look at that risk of non-communicable disease. Um, they are done with weighing scales that can be a beam scale or it could be digital um, for children. <clears throat> Um, and similarly for, for um, adults as well. Um, for children under the age of two years, we would measure recumbent length or the, the length of a child lying down since they're not able to stand straight. After two years and after a certain height, um, we will measure height standing up. So measuring height requires some kind of measuring board with the movable headpiece so that you can measure um, height. Usually this should be attached to a wall. Um, if you're measuring a recumbent child, <clears throat> you would want to place this child on the height board that is lying down on a flat surface. For example, a table on, on flat ground. Um, and then usually there is a movable footboard. Subsequent models in the series Modules in the series will talk in much greater detail about the methods used for anthropometry. Other measurements include for children head circumference. Um, so that is the, the measurement around a child's head. Um, head circumference certainly increases rapidly, especially in early life. This can be affected by both nutritional and non-nutritional factors. And this is true, honestly, of, of all kinds of anthropometry. Nutrition is a, a big reason for our body measurements, but it's not the only reason. So that needs to be kept in mind. Um, another measurement is the, um, the, the length around your arm. So the middle upper arm circumference or MUAC, um, that's a measure of, of all of that muscle and fat in the upper arm. So certainly with acute malnutrition, um, we have loss of both fat, fat and muscle mass, um, and so you will have a smaller muak. Um, so that can be an indicator of body composition, and it's applicable for adults and children, and can be a very easy way um, to quickly um, assess for acute malnutrition. Hip and waist measurements require certainly some practice, as, all, as do all of these. Um, we can measure waist circumference, that is the waist is halfway between the, the ribs um, and the iliac crest, so the, the top part of the pelvis. So between those two sets of bones, that would be the waist, and then the hip is that largest um, circumference around the buttocks. So waist circumference is related to insulin resistance, again, potentially leading to that non-communicable disease. Um, there are guidelines here, certainly central adiposity, which is fat around the belly, um, around the, the stomach area, the abdomen area, um, is certainly associated with increased risk of um, cardiovascular disease in particular. Um, usually we don't use a single anthropome anthropometry measurement to assess nutritional status. We will often construct an index. So an index is, is simply a number that is calculated from other numbers. Um, so for example, among nutritional indices, we would have the body mass index or the waist to hip ratio or weight for height um, or height for age or so on. Um, so let me mention body mass index. I've, I've already said that term a few times. This is, um, something that can be used um, to assess weight for height. You take the weight of an individual in kilograms, you divide it by the square of their height in meters. So if you can do this calculation for yourself, for an adult, if a BMI is less than 18.5, that indicates um, undernutrition. Um, normal, the normal range is 18.5 to 25, um, but starting at 25, that is the beginning of overweight, and then higher beyond 30 would be obesity. Um, weight for height, again, indicates body composition that also 
depends on sex and age. And then we talked about <clears throat> waist to hip ratio. So that's simply the waist circumference divided by the hip circumference. This is certainly going to be different between men and women. Um, a higher number indicates a larger waist. So more um, fat in particular around the abdomen. And again, that is uh, associated with increased chronic disease risk. So that's a brief introduction to anthropometry. Let's move on to B, which is biochemical methods or biomarkers. Um, these can be used again at the individual or the population level to identify or diagnose a nutritional problem. This could be in the form of a lack of nutrients, so a nutrient deficiency, or it could be too much um, or a toxicity of a nutrient. So again, use it for an individual or a population level. Um, biomarkers, there are many, many, um, and there are, um, and each of them is different. Each of them measures different things and has different considerations. So some biomarkers for some nutrients will measure immediate, very recent intake of nutrients. Other biomarkers reflect kind of the chronic consumption or lack of consumption of a nutrient. So it's important to really know which biomarker you have and what it is truly measuring in the body. So the other thing is that it can measure um, and identify conditions that are either acute and have a clinical manifestation or maybe subclinical. That for example, that, uh, the, that a person has a nutrient deficiency and it has consequences that do not have any visible signs or symptoms and so is subclinical. Um, and so sometimes biomarkers can be the, the first identification of a problem before clinical symptoms appear. There are other factors, again, um, that affect biochemical measurements or biomarkers. Um, for example, inflammation that might be due to illness or exposure to um, challenges within the environment. I'll give some specific examples in a, in a minute. Um, so there are different kinds of assessments. Um, you can do static tests, which measure the, new, the concentration of a particular nutrient in the blood. You can also measure um, in other parts, other um, um, parts of the body. So you can measure in urine. Um, there are some things that can be measured in hair even, um, so, so it does not vary, but usually um, urine and blood are the, the common ones. Um, so you can measure a particular nutrient or its metabolite. You can look for abnormalities in quantity or in specific metabolites that will indicate deficiency um, in particular. Um, you can look at blood itself um, and its constituents, we'll talk about that. Um, there might be some tissue specific chemical markers. Um, there are also other kinds of tests such as isotope tests that can be done. Those are less common. Um, you can also do functional tests. So functional tests are, are looking at a loss of function um, or a, a challenge to a physiological process. So for example, if we are concerned about vitamin A, um, you might look at visual adaptation to darkness. Um, those who are deficient in vitamin A will have a challenge in, in adapting to darkness or the lack of light. And so that would be a functional test for vitamin A deficiency. So I'll continue with the example of vitamin A deficiency. Um, what's important to note, and this is, again, we, have, we talked about this already, so this is a, a bit of a review. Um, but when we're talking about a dietary deficit in a particular nutrient, such as vitamin A, over time, that will lead to a depletion of that nutrient in tissue and plasma that will have systemic effects that might affect the growth of bone, um, the development of blood, um, it might affect immune function, and so on. Um, it's only after prolonged um, and continuation of, of deficiency and deprivation that you start seeing clinical effects. You might see anemia in the, or reduced growth in the case of vitamin A, 
and it can lead to um, effects on vision and eyes, um, ultimately leading to blindness. And as you progress on this pyramid of increased deficiency and prolonged deficiency, the risk of mortality also increases. So what's important to note when we're using, um, using any of these methods of nutritional assessment is that some methods will not capture um, this. So obviously, if we want to know that there is a chronic dietary deficiency, we want to assess diets. Um, biomarkers will help us at this level. Clinical, um, clinical measurements obviously do not come until you have that more extreme type of deficiency. But it's important to note that even without clinical manifestations, we can really affect a person's well-being, and the clinical manifestations will appear only with extreme deficiency. And when we have this observation of, of clinical symptoms, what this means is that we have a foundation in our population of probably widespread nutrient deficiency. So continuing on vitamin A, um, if we have inadequate dietary intake to meet our physiological needs, that leads to deficiency. Um, but there are other factors involved. And, and one of the big ones is infection. So certain types of infections um, can point to particularly to diarrhea, to measles and other things um, can, can make deficiencies worse. Um, when we measure in blood, um, what we often measure is serum or plasma retinol. And that's the main form of vitamin A that circulates in blood. And that is a reflection actually of vitamin A that is stored by the body um, and, and, and can indicate that as well. Um, so retinol is really best used for assessment of kind of subclinical deficiency in a population. And there are certain established cutoffs um, that indicate vitamin A deficiency in, in children and adults. And certainly that could be um, a moderate or severe deficiency. Let me give you a few more examples of, of some of our big um, nutritional concerns. So for example, iodine. Iodine can be measured um, from a urine sample. That's um, the most, most commonly used. Um, and that measures your iodine status right now. Um, it's much more recent in time. Um, you might use something like thyroid size to indicate longer term iodine status. Um, so what you might find is using different, and this is true of, of any nutrient, when you have multiple biomarkers that you can use, um, some might indicate the status of a person recently, and some might indicate something long-term. That's similar to anthropometry, right? As you might recall, if you have acute wasting, that suggests deficiency in the last weeks or month, whereas um, stunting in a child would represent deprivation across months or even years. So um, depending on urinary iodine levels, that indicates the, the severity of deficiency, the amount of intake, and like many other nutrients, um, you know, often our concern is about inadequate intake. It is possible for, for several nutrients, vitamin A um, and others, here iodine, to also have excessive intake as well. Um, and that could be, and that can also have a health consequences. Okay, let's talk about iron. Iron is a sometimes a tough one. Um, iron comes in different forms in our diets um, and largely has to do with whether they come from animal sources or plant sources. So the iron, um, the form of iron when we eat animal foods, um, it comes in the form of heme iron, which is that structure that you see that is a component of hemoglobin. Um, and that heme iron tends to be very bioavailable. Um, and so that is often uh, desirable when we have non-heme iron, as we find in plant foods, um, those can be in different forms that might be less available to our bodies. They're still important dietary sources, but um, requires more um, potentially. 
there are ways to improve um, absorption of iron. So for example, vitamin C improves iron absorption. Those come often um, from fruits and other things. Um, and if we want to look at different stages of iron deficiency, different biomarkers might be useful. Um, so we can look at um, common ones are things like serum uh, ferritin, transferrin receptor. Um, ferritin looks at depletion. Um, similarly for transferrin receptor, you might have um, iron deficiency anemia that you can use hemoglobin as a proxy. You can also use MCV. Um, there are really quite a few indicators and you don't need to know all of these details, but what's important to realize is that there are multiple indicators for iron. They measure different things. Um, so they might, ser serum ferritin is indicating the total stores of iron within the body. Um, others can be of other kinds of things. There are different cutoffs. Um, there are different indications that look at depletion of iron stores, they can indicate um, poor um, suboptimal production of red blood cells um, and other things. There are different laboratory methods that are required for different indicators. And then there are different considerations. So I already mentioned inflammation, um, infection as well. Many of these biomarkers are affected by inflammation and infection. Um, certainly the top three that you see there, but others as well. Um, the technical skill and resources required, the amount of blood that needs to be drawn all vary across indicators. So um, a few more words on this. Ferritin um, is um, in the blood, combines with iron and is stored in various parts of the body. Um, that can be maybe a, a first choice or an early choice to look at iron deficiency. Um, transferrin um, involves iron transport within blood and, um, and can indicate levels as well. Hemoglobin, as I mentioned, um, is, is that complex molecule that holds iron within red blood cells and carries oxygen to bodies. Um, and we have also hematocrit. Um, which comes out of a, a, a cell, um, um, a complete blood count. So, okay. So I mentioned a few limitations already of these biomarkers and these biochemical methods. Um, here are a few more. So certainly measurement error is possible. This is true um, for anthropometry as well, as you can imagine. Um, measurement error is the difference between a true value and what you measure. So that could be due to um, something biological and it could be due to the practice of drawing blood and analyzing. Um, so there are really many sources of error in all of these assessment methods. Um, some biomarkers will also vary um, between, you know, from day to day, sometimes even from morning to afternoon to evening. Um, so that's important to, to keep in mind and to know which biomarkers have that issue. Um, they're sensitive to recent consumption of food or so on. There's some nutrients that really don't have good specific biomarkers. Um, protein, I would argue, is one of them. Zinc, um, serum, you can measure serum zinc, but that can sometimes have challenges um, and not be responsive to change. So um, it's important to understand these if you are interested in working with biomarkers. Um, these all require training, equipment, supplies, um, so they are more expensive. And so it's hard to do them um, with as many people and a you know, large scale and, and often as we might do anthropometry, which is much easier. Um, and then we need to be always aware of consent. Um, this is particularly true of biochemical assessments because they involve drawing blood or taking um, other parts of the body. So they can be more invasive. All right, let me switch now to clinical methods. So clinical assessment is checking for visible signs um, in manifestations in the body, you know, whether that is emaciation, like a loss of body mass, um, you might have edema or, or swelling <clears throat> in different parts of the body. Um, there could be changes to the hair, there could be changes to the skin, um, really depends on the deficiency that you're talking about. 
Um, you might also probe with a, a patient or client um, about certain symptoms. So, um, or things that can affect nutri nutrient needs. So for, for example, perhaps there is a recent infectious disease, or maybe there's some more chronic condition um, like HIV that is affecting um, diets, um, people's ability to eat, affecting digestion and absorption of nutrients, and therefore increases the risk of developing malnutrition. <coughs> when we think about clinical symptoms, I think many of us will, will think of marasmus and quashioka as kind of the first examples of nutrient deficiency. And as you know, these are two um, manifestations of, of extreme you know, deprivation. Um, Kashioka um, is readily um, visible looking at UC distended abdomens, um, UC swelling, um, especially a bit noticeable in the ankles and the feet. Um, the behavior of the patient changes, so they might be more apathetic, they're not as responsive. Um, marasmus is, is uh, acute wasting. Um, there can be hair loss, there's you know, um, visible bones and et cetera. But these are not the only manifestations. There's really quite a lot more. Um, so let me give you some examples. And I have here on several slides, um, which you can take the time to review of, of different clinical signs for various nutritional deficiencies. So I'm not going to go over all these details, but hopefully that's, this is useful. Um, some things are very specific. So for example, night blindness um, can be quite specific to vitamin A deficiency. Um, vitamin D can result in extreme forms, can result in, in rickets on effects on bones. Um, vitamin K affects blood um, and clotting um, and so on. So their vitamin B can result, B1 can result in beriberi um, and there are several various kinds and forms and manifestations of that, various symptoms that are related to that. Um, the other B vitamins also have various sorts of forms. Um, niacin, as we know, um, can lead to pellagra. Um, there are others as well. Um, folic acid deficiencies can lead to neural tube defects in, in fetuses. Um, and, and so it continues. Um, so what you see here is for some nutrients, um, there, are, um, there are some specific symptoms that can strongly indicate what nutrient is the problem. Others, it's less true, right? You might have fatigue for many different kinds of nutrients. You might have, um, you know, effects on, on skin or edema for different kinds of nutrients. Um, here are a few more, these are the minerals. Um, so, you know, it, it's very hard to, to observe and say, um, from these symptoms, this is zinc deficiency, for example. Um, that would be difficult to do. So what else? The last method is, is dietary methods. So dietary assessment involves um, information that lets us look at quality and quantity of food and nutrient intake. And again, like all of these tools that can be done at an individual or population level. Um, these can be used to look at inadequate intakes, so eating not enough of a certain nutrient, but can also identify excess intake. Um, this could be excess to identify you know, toxic levels, but more importantly, um, or more commonly, would be to um, know when we're eating too much, especially if we're having too many calories um, that can increase the risk of overweight and obesity. There could also be um, intake of unhealthy foods, right? Very processed foods, for example. Um, so we can identify not just undernutrition, but these risk factors that lead to overweight and obesity and increase the risk of non-communicable diseases. And in particular, we worry about diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and certain types of cancers. And there are many foods that are implicated, but honestly, it's salt, sugar, and fat. 
um, and ultra processed foods, which tend to have high levels of these things, salt, sugar, and fat. Um, those are often what we are concerned about. So dietary assessment methods um, can be done directly on an individual or they could be more indirect. Um, they could be indirect involves looking at something above the individual level. So looking at the household or the national level, we'll talk about a few of these um, methods uh, towards the end of this video. But first, let me talk a little bit about some of the direct methods. Um, a lot of these are based on recall. They are retrospective. They look backwards and they might um, ask, what did you eat yesterday or in the last week or the last month? Um, sometimes you are looking for quantitative intakes. Other times you want to have um, more general indicators of dietary quality. There are... Um, other ways to go about this. So for example, it's possible to ask a, a participant to um, weigh food that they consumed. So it could be prospective. So you engage the person in, in um, keeping food records of what they eat. Um, you can also employ some new technologies, right? Using um, phone or mobile um, to capture what people are eating. And so there's a lot of work to use some of these new technologies as well. So a common method of individual level dietary assessment is the 24 hour dietary recall. This is a structured interview. So we will talk to a person and uh, talk about their consumption in the last 24 hours. Um, and we get detailed information on what they eat. And this gives us a, a way to, quanti to quantify um, food intake and nutrient intake. Um, this can be done and is often done face to face. It is possible to, to validate and conduct these by telephone. Um, again, the interview has a, a certain structure. It's often um, multiple attempts to help um, a person remember what they ate in a 24 hour period. Um, this includes food, it includes drink. Um, there are, we want to know what foods are eaten, sometimes a preparation method. We want to know ingredients, the recipes, the ways that they are prepared. So, um, you know, how are they cooked? Are they fried? Are they boiled? Um, you know, what's the method of cooking? If there's a commercial product, you know, what is the brand name? Um, and so that we can identify its contents. Um, we also need to estimate how much is eaten. So we'll talk, I'll give some a little more detail on this. This requires training, right? So the person who is collecting the data needs um, some detailed training. Um, there are methods to probe and try to help people remember um, ingredients, cooking methods, portion sizes. Um, people tend to forget what they drink and um, beverages can be important sources of nutrients. Um, of good and bad um, nutrients, um, people tend to forget snacks. So, you know, in the afternoon, if they eat um, some crisps or a piece of fruit, um, oftentimes people forget that. Um, also, people may not have as much knowledge of what they're eating when they eat outside the home, right? They may not know the exact recipe or content of a, of a dish or a snack that is eaten um, outside the home. So again, knowing what one is eating and how it is made and what ingredients are used is important. The other part is estimating portion sizes. So how much are you eating? In general, people have a, a lot of difficulty estimating portion sizes. Um, and so we need to develop methods um, to help them do this. And this often uses some kind of standardized portion sizes that is particular to your population of interest. So for example, you could have photographs that help you um, understand you know, what a size of a plate is and how much a portion is. You can use pictures, you can bring objects, um, you can use, um, you can go to a local market and buy bowls or cups um, so that people have a, a reference object that they can see that helps them measure. You might use a household utensil 
like a, a spoon, for example, to show, you know, how many spoons of sugar did you use? Um, sometimes people will even prepare food and have it so that they can um, say, you know, yesterday you ate rice, how much rice, here's some rice, show me exactly how much you put on the plate. Um, so, so those tricks are often used. Sometimes, um, for example, for fruit, we might use something like a, a categorical size. So is it a, a small piece of fruit? Is it a small banana or a medium banana or a large one? Um, we might use some natural measurements. So if we're talking about bread, we might talk about one slice of the bread. Um, we can use standard units of measurement. You know, how many milliliters of milk did you, or tea do you think you drank? Maybe it's just one cup. Um, and there are other, other methods you can use. It, people are creative with this and all of it is to help estimate as accurately as possible how big of a portion is consumed. So here are just some examples um, from different places. So here um, on the left side here, we have different kinds of foods where um, you can talk about kind of a small amount. If you can see here on this E, a small amount, something bigger, something bigger. Here is an example with papaya. If a slice, maybe one slice is that large. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, here's another way to do it, to say like, okay, you drank a cup of tea. Maybe it was in a cup like this or a cup like that. Maybe you added sugar, so you used a spoon of this size. Um, maybe you're eating some rice and you, you, um, do you use a plate of this size or a plate of that size or do you eat from a bowl? Um, maybe you ate more than one bowl. Um, so if you're taking soup, maybe you ate two of these bowls. So the, these are all strategies to help with portion sizes. Okay, another approach that is a little bit less intensive is the food frequency questionnaire, um, sometimes called FFQ. And so this is more of a list of foods, of beverages. Um, and so you go through the list of foods with a participant and you ask, um, do you eat this? Um, maybe it's, you know, fish soup. And how much do you eat or how frequently do you eat it? You know, every day, two or three times a, a week, once a week, like that. Um, so you have a certain time period and you ask how frequently does someone eat, eat different kinds of foods. Usually this is more than 24 hours. So we do a longer recall period. And this can be useful because there are certain foods we eat every day and some foods that we eat commonly, but not every day. So sometimes it's nice to look beyond 24 hours um, to understand the full picture of the typical or average diet. These FFQs um, can be done, um, a participant can do them themselves or they can be done with an interviewer. So for example, if a person um, does not have very much literacy, then an interview would be more appropriate. There are metrics, and we have talked about this a little bit. Um, for, for example, when we talked about infant and young child feeding, we talked about dietary diversity measures. These can be appropriate for the young child, but it can also be appropriate for other ages. Um, dietary diversity actually can be assessed at an individual or a household level. Um, household dietary diversity has been shown to be related to calorie and protein intake and naturally also household income. At an individual level, there are certain established metrics. Um, we talked about minimum dietary diversity for um, a child who is doing complementary feeding, so six to 23 months. Um, there has also been a minimum dietary diversity for women of reproductive age. Generally, these, um, these metrics and indicators um, identify um, and can be kind of a substitute for dietary quality and nutrient adequacy. So the definition of minimum when we talk about dietary diversity is what is the minimum necessary to ensure a good quality diet or adequate intake of all nutrients. 
or especially micronutrients. So here's a few um, household and individual level measurements that have been used by um, different international bodies. Um, usually these involve looking at different groups of food. So when we talked about children and minimum dietary diversity and minimum acceptable diet, we were talking about those eight food groups. Um, for women, we actually in increased that to 10. At a household level, we can use even more categories. Um, so to understand what, what dietary quality is happening at a household or an individual level. All right. Um, so those are the direct measurements. I just want to spend a few minutes and talk about more indirect methods of looking at nutritional status, especially of populations. So one, um, one approach is to look at vital statistics. So for example, you can look at mortality data in a population and morbidity to some degree. Um, and that can give you not a very direct look at nutrition, but it definitely can identify when a population has a high risk and how much of a risk is involved. So when we look at mortality, especially when we look at child mortality, that is often related to malnutrition. So if we're looking at child or infant mortality, when we look at low birth weight, for example, um, even life expectancy, these are often indicating malnutrition. Now, of course, mortality um, and, and low birth weight and et cetera is affected by more than nutrition, right? So it's not very specific, um, but they are useful for understanding what might be happening in the population. Um, so uh, just using mortality data alone is not enough. Um, it does not give you an idea of nutrition overall, but it does indicate the potential for an important underlying problem. Um, when we look at morbidity, we can look at that from a community level. Um, we can look at it from health facilities. And those can be useful, especially if we're talking about acute malnutrition, talking about anemia, um, kind of these clinical manifestations of vitamin deficiencies. Um, all of those things can give you indirect information about the nutritional status of a community. There are other things that happen more at the national level. So I mentioned the food balance sheets. Those are from FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN. Um, and those are data that help you identify and quantify the availability of specific foods for consumption within a country. Um, these are commonly used in the food and agricultural sectors. They are used to monitor um, patterns globally, trends over time. And they are, are strictly at the national level. It, they do not capture um, differences within a country. They don't identify vulnerable groups. Um, it, it's a very um, national level average measure. Um, there are data that these food balance sheets provide on energy, protein, and fat, and how much um, is available to people, what is the supply of both foods and nutrients. But keep in mind that just because there is food and it's available doesn't mean that people consume them, right? There are all those issues that we spoke of earlier about the food environment, about people's access to different types of food. So availability is important, but it's not enough for the full picture. Um, but we can use food balance sheets to understand what's happening nationally. It could be a way to set public health priorities, to identify problems, to formulate policies. We can make comparisons between countries. We can look at trends over time. We can make some predictions about the possibility of micronutrient deficiencies. So there are certainly valuable information here. There are also household um, surveys um, that exist that help us look at nutrition. Again, this is the situation at a household level. Um, and those can give you information about total food that is available for the household. It may not adequately um, cover food that is eaten outside the home. 
which we know with increasing urbanization and changes within the food system, we are eating more outside the house. Um, these household um, consumption and expenditure surveys can be used to track changes over time. Um, but again, keep in mind that inside a household, we have different people who will eat different things. Um, what we eat as individuals differs from our household depending on our age um, and depending on gender often as well. Um, men and women can have different patterns. This is especially true when there's some food insecurity. Um, we can use these kinds of surveys to monitor food security in a global level. And um, we can have an understanding if we have household level data, this is a step beyond food balance sheets because we can look at the variability from house to house. Um, and that helps us get information to estimate how much undernourishment is in a population. Okay, so there's quite a lot of information here, um, but we've just introduced the idea of nutritional assessment and talked about various methods that are used. These methods are in constant development um, and they're extremely useful for various reasons. So one, what we would like you to keep in mind is that these are all tools to identify whether an individual or a population is at risk of malnutrition. And when we talk about malnutrition, we're always talking about both under and over nutrition. There are different methods. We talked about the ABCD. So there's anthropometric, biochemical, clinical, and dietary assessment. Um, for children, th these are helpful in, in looking at poor growth um, and development of a young child. As we go into adulthood, we can look at that acute malnutrition, but we can also look at risk for non-communicable diseases, things like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and certain types of cancer. Um, in general, nutritional assessment is important for identifying nutrient deficiencies and undernutrition for adults and for children. Um, this, can, this information helps us develop interventions, programs, and policies to prevent disease, nutrition-related disease. And once those interventions, programs, and policies are in place, these tools and methods allow us to monitor the effectiveness of them over time. All right, so this concludes our topic six for module one. Thank you very much for your attention.